Welcome to Study with the Best, the magazine show that's all about CUNY. I'm Tina Beth Pina at the Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum. On today's show, we look at veterans across the CUNY spectrum. There are 3,000 student veterans in the CUNY system and that number is rising. Coming up, we'll explore the services available to them and take a look at the remarkable vets that are in the CUNY system. The CUNY Office of Veteran Affairs helps veterans transition successfully into student life as well as offering them support in other meaningful ways. Lisa Viatha, the Office Director and a Gulf War veteran, explains. The role of my office is to make sure that, regardless, student veterans get the best service they need. Academic services, beyond academic services, transitional services, career services, housing, child care. Our student veterans have a great opportunity because of the new task force recommendations. There is a published report called Soldiers to Scholars, and this report has over 38 recommendations that we can use. There are new spaces that have been designed at City College, John Jay, and I know the College of Staten Island has had new space designed and designated just for student veterans. We're trying to make sure that this happens university-wide, that there's a special designated space for veterans. We're also making sure that orientation takes place on each campus specific for veterans. Faculty members are being trained with cultural competency on how to interact with veteran students. It's easier for veterans to speak to other veterans, whether they're faculty or staff or veteran students, because you understand the lingo, you understand a lot of the transitional issues that, that may occur. I am Mariette Catherine Kalinowski, and I am a second year MFA student here at Hunter. I wanted to be in the military since I was eight years old. I served in the United States Marine Corps from 2002 until 2010, and I did two tours in Iraq. In the military, you always have a buddy. When you're in combat, it's specifically to make sure that you're, you've got each other's backs. And by creating that same system on CUNY campuses, veterans help each other. I first came to CUNY in 2006, and I officially started classes in spring of 2007 after my first tour in Iraq. I knew there were other veterans, but I didn't know how to seek them out. I became involved with the Project for Returning Opportunities in Veterans Education. Every CUNY campus that PROVE is on um, has a student veteran space and advocates and coordinators who facilitate goodness. Veterans help each other, and it's, uh, it's a recipe for success. My name is Adam Balmel. I'm studying political science. I am a sophomore. This is actually the end of my first semester at uh, John Jay College. I was never looking to join the military whatsoever, but I, I'm sort of like Marty McFly from Back to the Future, where you know, if someone were to try to say that you can't do something, I'm, I've always been that type of person to want to prove them wrong. I was in the US Navy. I was stationed on the USS Nimitz, and I was in for a total of about four years. And I know people, you know, that aren't in the military think, you know, military life is so difficult, and it's not like it's not, but school life is in certain ways more stressful than military life. All the friends I know pretty much are all veterans at John Jay College. So, I mean, it's, they've almost become like a second family to me, a huge second family. My name is uh, Lawrence Eubing. I go by Larry. I'm a student at John Jay. I'm uh, studying forensic psychology. I'm a veteran, Navy veteran. 27 years of service, retired in 2005. Because I served so long, I'm used to things being very structured and people doing what they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do it. And it was an adjustment for me to sort of go into a more of a free-flowing atmosphere. When I identify myself as a veteran, uh, most of the students seem interested. You know, like, where have you been? What have you done? You know, why did you join? Those types of things. And uh, it's a really, it's a great pleasure for me to interact with them. Our presence is good for the other students too, the civilian students. They get to learn that, you know, people who served in the military, especially the ones that served in combat, aren't monsters. They're just like they are. They just happen to have different experiences. My name is Monique Thomas. I'm originally from Queens. 
I am a student at BMCC majoring in healthcare information technology. I was in the U United States Navy for eight years straight out of high school. I got out in 1996 on an honorable discharge. Um, I was still under 30. I really didn't know the direction I wanted to go. So it was a lot of instability. There is a student veterans club at Burr Manhattan Community College. They meet every Wednesday at two o'clock. And in those meetings, you not only connect with fellow student vets, but you find out so much information that maybe you just didn't know during your transition meeting after you got out of the military. It's important to connect with other student veterans because where you are is where they've been. They could say, you know what, I know what you've been through, I've been there, done that. Here's a person that can help you get to where I am. I think CUNY is a great support system because when you lose a job or you, you just don't feel like you have a direction, CUNY provides that for you, that first step in that healing process and that direction for you. And I've, I've really been very pleased with the assistance that I've received at CUNY. It's been a big help. A new book challenges long-held stereotypes about Vietnam vets and uncovers the war from local vets themselves, including women who have been historically less open about their Vietnam service. I interviewed uh, about, about 190 Vietnam veterans and a number of other people who are connected with servicing veterans in one fashion or another, including psychologists and so on. Uh, one of my interviewees, a man named Bernie Edelman, who is a lobbyist for the Vietnam Veterans of America in Washington, D.C., and is a son of Brooklyn, um, told me, and forgive my language, and you may have to bleep this, but he, <laughs> he said, you know, the assumption was the war was fucked up, so we were fucked up. Um, and Bernie's a great example of the case, that's, uh, the, of the truth that it's not the case. Um, and so it, it, veteran after veteran hammered home the notion that just because we served in Vietnam doesn't mean we're all crazy. John Rambo, a drifter, just passing through their town. Rambo is one very powerful example. The very first uh, Rambo film was called First Blood. Now it's a film about post-traumatic stress disorder. And it, it became a way of thinking about Vietnam through this lens of post-traumatic stress that struck me as just absolutely incorrect. Now, many men and women have suffered from uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm not about to deny it, but it doesn't mean that um, these people are in some ways um, incapacitated um, by their previous experiences. At least one stereotype was that all Vietnam veterans were drug addicts. And um, I can absolutely say that is not true. There was marijuana there. Um, there were other drugs. and. One of the things that you told your troops, um, we will not be involved with even smoking pot uh, and other drugs, and especially out in the jungle, because we depended on one another. And you could not be in a different uh, frame of mind dealing with uh, combat, being in, in, in on guard duty at night in the middle of the jungle. So I would say there were drugs in the rear, but not out in the, in, in the bush. And 99.9% .9 of my time was in the bush. The ponytail veteran. This is the, the guy that you picture primarily because of what the media have kind of um, put out there. And also because there are a, a few people like this. And, and so when there are a few people like that, it's an automatic reinforcement and, and we're all like that. But uh, you think of the guy with the gray hair and the ponytail and insignia all over, and he's, he's riding, a, riding the hog, you know? For a long time, it was very difficult to find a, a woman who was uh, serving, who did serve in Vietnam, who was willing to share. There are th certain things about a woman's experience that are quite profoundly different from a man's experience in Vietnam. And uh, many of these women have felt as though their service had been exploited in more than one way. It was kind of strange in the fact that, you know, at first you think, oh, I kind of like those odds. Look at all those men, me, and whatever. And um, 
then when you get over there, and this is not speaking to the work angle of it because that's a whole different animal. I think after I'd been there about two, three months, I got to the point where I just didn't want to deal with, with men in general. And then, you know, I ended up at my last place and met the guy I ended up marrying. <laughs> it was kind of, kind of an odd thing. But I have been very lucky. I had, you know, one attempt a guy I knew got drunk and tried to, to rape me. And luckily he was drunk enough that I could, I could humiliate him to go back to his hooch and leave me alone. But there were a lot of women who didn't have that wherewithal or who didn't have that lucky a situation. One friend of mine never let anyone know she was a vet after she went back to school because when she went to school she interviewed looking for her um, further credentials in, in nursing. Well she found that herself across the desk from a woman who said well I can't even admit you to this institution because I don't believe in the war. You know nowadays that wouldn't even be permitted but she just clammed up after that and no one heard that she was a vet. She unfortunately went through a very awful, awful period of, of PTSD because of other things that had happened over there. She had been raped. She had gone to her uh, superior officer at the hospital and he said, well, what do you expect? You know, you're here with all these men. What do you expect? It's probably your fault. I could investigate it, but I'd have to stop the war to do it. Meeting and speaking with these individuals broadened my perspective on the way the world works. It, it demonstrated to me some, one of the great powers of oral history, and that is each one of us possesses a fragment of the truth. We have to look at multiple pieces of evidence, multiple fragments of that truth in order to get a better understanding of what the past was like and what our world today is like. <laughs> In 1964, Jane Katz began her career as a member of the U.S. Olympics synchronized swimming team. Now at 71 years old, she's not only still a world-class swimmer, but she's also a pioneer in rehabilitation through water exercises. <laughs> the latest splash is the Wets for Vets program, water exercise techniques and training for vets not only physically, but holistically, spiritually, emotionally, to have fun while integrating back into their civilian life. Every member of the student body is more than welcome to come. Water's the great equalizer. My father was a veteran, and many people in my life I've known have been veterans. My late husband was a veteran. The students that would come in as veterans even though they were at school, they seem removed from the mainstream of civilian life and students. We've had several uh, veterans at the school here that have come back and had to deal with things like family problems at home that they could not take care of when they were overseas, uh, financial obligations and so forth. So it's just been huge in my personal life getting that exercise, which is not easy to come by with a grueling schedule that we have to maintain here as college students. You've been away so long from your family, they sometimes say you, you have changed because you have so come adapt to a war zone that you're always like sometimes on the edge. So what I do enjoy here is that we get to release our stress. Playing water volleyball, stretching, buddying up, because it's the buddy system, both on the field and in the water. Working together gets you to get away from your immediate concerns in life. Perhaps they were very, very fit when they were in the service, and when they come out, they don't want to work out necessarily the way we normally think of going to a gym or a pool, because they don't have to now. I do have injuries with my joints and um, when I'm in the water because of that, I push my body more so I get more out of my workout than if I were supposed to go to the gym. Also when you're working out in the gym, you don't have the, I guess, the surrounding of talking to people. Many of the people that join our Wets for Vets program are not swimmers yet. They can run, they can cycle, they are trained to do that, but the swimming is the X factor. So it's really important for people to kind of aspire to something. Some of the 
muscles and joints aren't the way they should be as opposed to some of the other students that are non-veterans here. So the water has just been tremendous in giving us that advantage uh, from a physical standpoint. And then psychologically, it's uh, also just smoothing and just relaxing in a different environment as opposed to loud music in a gym. When I'm in the water, no matter what my day is like, I finally wake up. And then you can go on with the rest of your day. And that mantra has been with me my entire life. And it was just a year ago, almost when my late husband passed away, that we started the program. So it, it's a very personal time. I'm sure that many of the vets who have lost their buddies or have had injuries or their buddies have had injuries, they remember that. And that's why it's so important to, to keep their, their spirit alive and blooming. When we come in, if something is wrong, I could always talk to Professor Katz, like maybe grieve, because I've dealt with this this semester. I'm still dealing with it, but when I get in the pool and when I get out, I'm totally different. I feel happier. I feel like my mind is more calm, more relaxed. I can focus. It makes us feel great by the end of the day and be able to tackle our homework and integrating us basically back to civilian life. Just be able to let everything go. She says her guardian angels always help her to make the right life decisions. Barry Mitchell has the story of one veteran who has figured out the equation for happiness. All right, we're going to start off with proof number one. Anna Majoka teaches algebra and geometry at Elmont Memorial High School in Elmont, New York. I decided to become a mathematics teacher because it was my favorite subject in high school. But before the math drills came the close order drills. I went into the Navy and served for eight years active on five years reserve, so 13 years altogether. This is a story of talent, resourcefulness, and determination. I'm originally from El Paso, Texas, born and raised. My mother is from Mexico. English is my second language. My mother raised us. I am the youngest of nine children. I have four brothers and four sisters. I was the only one to graduate high school. For, for my family, work was more important than, than education, but that was my comfort zone. I felt best at school. I did well in school, maybe that's why I felt so comfortable there. Anna's good grades got her into Texas Tech University. I did one semester at Texas Tech, and I couldn't stay because I couldn't afford it. So the main reason I joined the Navy was to get money for college. So. USS John F. Kennedy CV-67 DK-2 Ana Iris Bernal has been inscribed into the deck log of the United States ship John F. Kennedy CV-67. On board ship, the classes were free. Any opportunity I had to take a class, I took. As a matter of fact, I was able to take three classes on board my ship while I was serving on board the Kennedy. We completed my first two years of college just because it was tough if we were out to sea. You know, it was tough to like go to class or um, if I was already stationed on land, then I had to make sure that my schedule fit their schedules. I was almost not enlisting for personal reasons, but I think I made the right choice. So how'd she wind up in New York? Love. Love for mathematics and... My husband, we met in the Navy. We both were stationed in Long Beach, California at the time. He's originally from New York. He was a Queens College graduate, so he suggested I look into Queens College. Oh my God, it's so great to see you. And that's where Anna met her mentor, Dr. Alice Arts, head of math education at Queens College. We invited Dr. Arts to Elmont Memorial High School to tell us about the widely acclaimed program she founded, Time 2000. Time stands for Teaching Improvement Through Mathematics Education. We are a four-year program that recruits students right out of high school who are interested in mathematics and possibly mathematics teaching. As Time 2000 students, we major in mathematics and minor in secondary education. In exchange for their $1,000 per semester scholarship, they are required to teach for a minimum of two years in a middle school or high school anywhere in the United States. I didn't think I'd qualify because I was an older person coming back, you know, out of school for 10 years. So I asked, and they said, let's give it a shot. But the college courses Anna had taken while serving in the Navy did not correspond to the courses needed for the Time 2000 degree. Anna had to start from scratch. 
my goal was to become a mathematics teacher. And if it took a couple more, more years, why not? I did use my GI Bill to actually serve as my income during the time, so I didn't have to get a job. Four years later, I graduated through the time program. And began putting into practice Time 2000's innovative teaching techniques at her new job at Elmont Memorial High School. How do you teach a fascinating math lesson? You don't walk in and say, today we're going to learn about symmetry. Mm -hmm. That's boring. One of the reasons why I love geometry so much is that it's so relatable to real life. Um, for example, one of the projects that they do is finding similarity in car logos. I even tell them how I came up with the idea. Oh. I was just sitting at a red light. And I looked at the car in front of me, and it was a Honda. And I drive a Chevrolet, so I looked at the logo on my, on my driver's, you know, my driving wheel. And I said, wow, that's a parallelogram in a square. And after that, when, one of the questions in the project is, how do you see car logos differently? And all of them say, well, now I look for symmetry. Does it have line symmetry? Can I rotate it? When you least expect it, math is right next to you. She had her bachelor's degree. She had her dream job. She had a husband and three children. Next, Anna went back to Queens College and earned a master's degree. And in 2012, Anna spoke at her own master's graduation. Finally, my degree means to me that I have completed another great and challenging stage in my life. With determination, sacrifice, and passion, getting an education is always an option. You know, I've always had these guardian angels that, you know, guide me in a certain way. And I ended up at Queens College and with the Time 2000 program, and it was a blessing in disguise. Barry Mitchell, study with the best. Let's take a look back at a soldier and a CUNY grad who describes his incredibly dangerous tour of duty in Iraq and the agonizing wait at home for his wife. Every day I disarmed these explosive devices and I knew every time I disarmed one that somebody would live. I remember the day uh, of 9-11. Uh, I was in my uh, American history class. I think I was 16 at the time. On that day I, I knew I was going into the military. And I remember when we started dating, he said to me, Anne, are you sure you want to do this? You know, I'm leaving. Like, I have my contract set to go. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, we're 17. This isn't going to last till next year. I was a freshman in college when he left. It was tough. I knew that I wanted to go into the uh, Special Forces. Uh, I wanted something that I'd get the best training that I could, where I could also feel like I had the biggest impact. So these are, these are some examples of some of the uh, munitions that we'd find. You can see a line of uh, C4 explosives running across the top. So this is just doing demolition. We basically set them up like this so that we could destroy it. Every time I would leave my house, I was scared to come home because I knew that if something happens, like you don't get a phone call, they come to the door. I just found that the training was so in depth with the original two year training pipeline and then for both deployments, we did so much training that I, I felt ready for it. My take on it was just be as careful as I can and hope for the best. My worry was less for me and more for my wife. I trained hard so that I you know, could get home and so that I could bring my team home. Uh, and yeah, I didn't want to put her through that and, and have her have to live with you know, losing me over there. I always you know, made sure to let him know, I want to know, like I want to know what's going on, I want to know what you're doing, like that, that's going to help me get through it. And he did. Just talking to each other and, and letting the other person know what's going on in your life, what thoughts you're having, uh, it's, it's huge. I think especially in a long distance or a, a military relationship, uh, communication is, is it's vital. Well, I was very careful about how I did things. And luckily uh, that, that paid off because we managed to get through the uh, deployment with no casualties from uh, my team, so we brought everyone home. I flew from Iraq to uh, Germany to Ireland 
and I called her uh, from Germany and I said, hey, uh, what are you doing tonight? I knew when he said that, I just started screaming. My mom woke up, she heard me screaming. She started screaming, this is before we even heard anything. And he's like, I'm in Germany. And I'm like, oh my God, it's over. <laughs> For about the first few days of it, I said, oh, this is great, I'm on vacation, I, I don't have work to do, I could get ready to go to school and everything. I was so used to a very regimented life and very, uh, you know, I knew what I was doing every day. I had to be at work at six o'clock and, and I had a real sense of purpose. And then I got out and uh, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't in the military anymore. I, I wasn't, uh, you know, doing a job anymore. Uh, I was going to become a student in, in a few weeks, but uh, even that, I felt like I kind of gave up a lot of my identity. I also felt like I lost uh, my friends, the, the people who I uh, spent all my time with, the guys who I went to war with. Uh, they were all back in Virginia or over in Iraq or Afghanistan, and I was back in New York getting ready to become a student. Then I started school and uh, I kind of felt like I found, found a sense of purpose again. Knowing that I could do things that most people might think they can't do, um, you know, going from disarming bombs uh, to taking tests, you feel like you can do it uh, and you feel like you know you can do well with it. The biggest impact that our whole experience had on it is that you just appreciate everything more. And even now, I mean, you, you know, you argue about stupid things and you get mad over things that don't matter and we're just like, this is, you know, like what we've been through, it's, it's, it just doesn't matter. Take the opportunity now to thank your family for being there. Don't leave things that should be said for later, because later may pass before you realize it. And never, I mean never, take your family and friends for granted, because without them, you have nothing. Since the piece first aired back in 2012, Garen and Anna have renewed their vows. Garen is also heavily involved in veterans advocacy work at NYU Law. That's our show for today. For more information on what you just saw, log on to our website at cuny.tv or you can Facebook and tweet us. Thanks for watching. See you next time.